In these graves lie some of the unsung heroes of Dunkirk, members of the Royal Warwickshire Regiment who held off the Germans while 350,000 of their brothers in arms escaped. 85 of those left behind were massacred by the SS in a barn near the little Flanders town of Wormhout. The man said to be responsible for the massacre, SS Hauptsturmführer Wilhelm Monke, has never been brought to trial and is still a free man. Tonight, we ask why. This is Lübeck near Hamburg in northwest Germany. If Wilhelm Monker is ever to face justice, this is the place where he would stand trial. Senior state prosecutor Oswald Kleiner had mounted an investigation into the massacre in 1974. So why had it come to nothing? The investigation against Wilhelm Monker has a history. We had to end it in 1974. We had to close it because we hadn't got sufficient evidence. So we sought out and collated the evidence and passed it on military documents, the names and addresses of French and German witnesses, and those of massacre survivors like Reg West, who were herded into a tiny barn and attacked with machine guns and grenades. At the same time, they throwed several bombs in, and one lad was only a boy, and he hit the post of the hut, and the thing burnished at um, uh, Evans. Bert Evans was the lad was on you. And it his arm was practically gone. Bert Evans is another of the few remaining survivors who know what happened that day. We're taking Bert and three of his comrades back to the massacre site in Flanders. Brian Fahey helped fight a gallant rearguard action, ran out of ammunition, was wounded, and joined the others as a prisoner of war. Alf Toome still has vivid nightmares about what he and his mates endured. And he says he'll never forget the face of the SS officer in charge. Charles Daly was machine gunned and lost a leg. Like the others, he's received neither recognition nor compensation for what he went through in the massacre of the Warwicks. Royal Warwickshire Regiment has a proud tradition stretching back 300 years to 1685 when the 6th Foot was formed. A century later, the 6th Foot was renamed the 1st Warwickshire Regiment. For 300 years, the men of the Royal Warwicks have been fighting in campaigns and major wars all over the globe. They've produced their fair share of heroes and generals including the legendary Montgomery of Alamein. Charlie Call Watson, you are thinking. And that is dangerous. And we'll try that once again. Call Watson, stand still. Stand up! The Warwicks have now become part of the Royal Regiment of Fusiliers, and in the 2nd Battalion, the direct descendants of the Wormhout victims can still be found, 
both in a military and a personal sense. The battalion commander, Lieutenant Colonel Joe Gunnell, today finds himself surrounded by the same regimental silver that decorated the mess of the Royal Warwicks when his father commanded them. Um, because, of course, he was captured by the, the Wehrmacht at the same time, presumably, as the massacre, and was marched off as a prisoner of war for nearly five years. But I went back there with him just before I joined the army, just before I left school. We went round, found the ditch where he was captured in Wormwood. Both officers and men have Wormhood connections. Lance Corporal David Braithwaite. My grandfather was with the 2nd Battalion Royal Warwicks. From what I know, he fought at Verma and they pulled down to Dunkirk and he died at Dunkirk. I suppose his number was up. By the end of May 1940, the Allied forces found themselves trapped at Dunkirk. The armada of little ships that delivered them to England made history. The men who bought the time to make that escape possible did not. And these are the men the Warwicks helped to save, the Dunkirk survivors who return every year to honor those who did not come home. As the German army, the Wehrmacht, tried to cut off the Allies' escape route, they first captured Abbeville and moved north to take Boulogne and then Calais. But they were unable to breach the perimeter defences the Allies had established round Dunkirk. The job was given to a crack SS regiment, the Leibstandarte Adolf Hitler. It was here at Wormhut that the Royal Warwickshires made their last stand. They were part of a rearguard action fought by many regular units of the British Army. The victor in the Battle of Wormhut now lives openly in a pretty village outside Hamburg as plain Wilhelm Monke. In May 1940, Hauptsturmführer Wilhelm Monke distinguished himself not so much by what he did in battle, but by what he did after it. Madame Solange Ley's farm was directly in his path. I was 15 years old at the time. There was a tank hidden here. A German soldier had been killed by the British who were over there behind the hedge. We were in the pigsty. We saw what had happened and came out. My parents, myself and our Polish maid. The Germans saw us and were really angry. They lined us all up, right here against the wall. There was a French soldier hiding in the stable. He saw what was happening through a hole in the door and gave himself up so that the Germans wouldn't shoot us. They threw themselves on him straight away, smashed his rifle and took him away as a prisoner together with the British. Those Germans took the French and British soldiers across the field and into the pasture, down there. They herded them into the little shelter and shot them all. In this dilapidated old barn, at least 85 men were killed in cold blood. So they slot one bomb into the yard and one chap was a full sergeant. I don't know whether he tried to pick it up or drop on it, but he was dead on account of the, the explosion. And nobody else at the shrapnel hit that man. And the next time, they throwed two in with the stick bombs. Uh, CSM Jannins was a man that I knew in India and as he saw the bomb come in, he tried to grab it to throw it back, but he couldn't do it, so it exploded in his forehead of his body and he was blown to bits. When the Germans threw the first grenades into the barn, Company Sergeant Major Jennings and Sergeant Moore 
threw themselves on the grenades to take the force of the blast and save their comrades. Their valor has never been recognized. Bert Evans' life was saved, but the first grenade blew off his right arm. They stripped us, searched us, took all identity discs. We thought they wanted to get rid of us. I was so naive. I thought they had put us in there to shelter us from the rain. And then two hand grenades came in, and then it was obvious that they intended to murder us. There was the more shooting going on and screaming. And Kelly, who was just in front of me, Kelly was, and he got his leg actually blowed up in his trousers. He was pounding on the floor. So cut, cut it off, cut it off. The original barn has long gone, but even the outline that we built is enough to evoke powerful and painful memories. We well, had some young boys here, and that's the hardest part about it. I mean, I was a serving soldier, I'd already done seven years. They looked to me for a bit of guidance, but I couldn't give them no guidance here. They said hello and goodbye. The mess or scattered, but it's different, different angles. We know a load of bastards. Got no love for them whatsoever. It wasn't necessary. And everybody threw bombs and... and, and, and automatics. And I heard a man say, <laughs> and then I heard a palamon said the Lord's Prayer. <laughs> this one said was dead. And there was that many sitting up, and they were still dead. And I was towards the back, and they had three or four standing with the open door. And they had just opened up with everything they'd got. This skeleton structure shows just how small the cow barn was. It's hard to believe that around 100 men were crammed into a space little bigger than a domestic garage. At least 85 men were murdered. In fact, those murders were not the only atrocities that took place that day. Evidence of others comes from local civilians forced to flee their homes. Madame Elizabeth de Couvillère had put her belongings in a wheelbarrow, grabbed her children and aged parents, and taken to the road. Après notre départ, le long de la route, nous avons été obligés de. We had to leave straight away through the German lines. At several places along the way, we saw British soldiers lying beside the road. They had all had their skulls shattered in exactly the same way, and their rifles lay broken in pieces beside them. But might they not have died in battle? Was she sure they'd been assassinated? They must have been killed, for they'd been lined up in that way all along the roadside, each with their skulls smashed. Perhaps some of them had been wounded already, that is possible, but they'd certainly been finished off. The Warwick massacre has made such a profound impression on the local people that they keep the memory of it alive through generation after generation. Our most beautiful flowers, our gratitude and our tears are not enough thanks for such supreme courage. We will never forget you. We offer you these flowers in gratitude, sympathy and friendship between all nations. 
We mourn the death of these soldiers who knew how to be brave. Some were murdered in a barn, others in battle, facing the enemy or trying to save the others. The key question, of course, is who was responsible. Wilhelm Monke took over command of the 2nd Battalion Leibstandarte SS on the 28th of May, the day of the massacre, after his senior officer had been mortally wounded. The fire damage battalion diary for that day, which has never before been made public, shows that he was responsible for the final stages of the battle for Wormhut and was in command at the time of the killings. Years later, a picture in a magazine brought it all back for Reg West. My wife saw that magazine weekend and I was told by the wife, who's that? And I said, that's officer named Munker who stood in the barn and said in German, Nischgefangen, which means no prisoners. Another curious detail leads one to believe that the massacre was planned. The barn in which it happened has long gone, but this framework approximates as closely as possible its size, shape and location. Now, the French soldier who saved the lives of Madame Ley and her family was brought in from the farmhouse over in that direction, whereas the British prisoners came from exactly the opposite direction over there. So, obviously the Germans in the Ley farmhouse knew in advance exactly where to send that French soldier for execution. In 1946, the British War Crimes Investigation Unit, based at the so-called Cage in Kensington Palace Gardens, investigated the massacre at Wormwood. Richard Richter was one of the interrogating officers. We had to sift through uh, literally hundreds and hundreds of SS men who had to be interrogated in the various localities we found them to uh, sort them out and then um, come uh, to a conclusion that the uh, unit that was uh, responsible for these atrocities was the Leibstandarte. And uh, we nailed it down to the battalion which actually took part in the fighting for Wormwood. There were three battalions. But the battalion who did the actual fighting uh, was the 2nd Battalion, uh, which was commanded uh, by um, a uh, Hauptsturmführer called Wilhelm Monke. The report on Wormhut, which Richter and his co-investigators prepared, has been shrouded in official secrecy, which has actually hindered prosecution. In reality, the report is so secret, we obtained four copies from different sources in as many weeks. The original file, on which no action has ever been taken, remains a classified document until the year 2022. And that, says Jeff Rooker MP, is a scandal. I haven't fully got to the background of why they're covered for 75 years. My understanding of it is, though, it's because they name individuals. They're not policy documents covered by the 30-year rule. They're not census information, which is covered by 100 years, or MI5 covered by 100 years. But because they name individuals, most of whom are dead, I might add, uh, most of the people who put the reports together, most, not all, are dead. Most of the survivors are dead. There are only five, to the to best of our knowledge. Most of the Germans are dead, not all of them. But the fact of the matter is, I can not see any justification whatsoever for them being covered by a 75-year rule under the Official Secrets Act. We traced Hugo Wetzmann, once a member of the Leibstandarte rowing team, and one of the SS officers interrogated about the massacre in 1946. He refused to talk to us. However, he did tell his interrogators back in 1946 that it was common knowledge in the regiment that Monke gave the massacre order. Monke is fingered by Germans and the British. So there isn't any doubt about Monka, and really that's where the box stops. Monka's troops continued to be involved in atrocities throughout the rest of the war. By June 1944, when his Panzer Regiment was retreating through France, Monka was directly linked to the murder of three unarmed Canadian soldiers. Again at Malmedy in Belgium in December 1944, 
Monka's men were responsible for the massacre of 100 unarmed American soldiers. Both his boss, Sepp Dietrich, and his subordinate, Jürgen Piper, were found guilty at the Nuremberg trials for their part in that massacre. However, Monka couldn't be found. By then, he'd been captured by the Russians, who refused to cooperate with the Allies. The Reverend Leslie Aitken took up the case of the Vermut massacre on behalf of the survivors in 1975. I think in my heart that Wilhelm Munker was responsible for the massacre. But I also know that I can't produce enough evidence to prove it. In 1973, on behalf of the, uh, the survivors, I took the matter up with the German authorities in Lübeck and later in Ludwigsburg. I presented them with all the evidence that I had together with stories from the Canadians who wanted him just after the war and I was told that due to lack of witnesses it was, no, it was not possible to prosecute him. Today Wilhelm Munker lives comfortably and openly alongside several former SS colleagues in the village of Basbüttel near Hamburg. He's even in the phone book though he certainly didn't want to talk to us. Monker is proud to have been the commandant of Hitler's bunker and he's happy to receive the £20,000 a year army pension he gets as a retired major general. He has escaped prosecution so far largely because by the time the Russians had released him in 1955 his crimes had been virtually forgotten by the authorities. But this week in Lübeck we gave the state prosecutor the evidence he needed to reopen the case. And that's exactly what he's done. We have the addresses of British survivors. We have the addresses of French witnesses. The addresses of former SS officers. A copy of Mr. Aitken's book. And the battalion archives, records of that day. This gives our lawyers new opportunities to open investigations. We will conduct them very carefully and with every possible speed. And we would welcome any further support you can give us in the way of evidence, so that it will help us in our investigations. We also have, sitting alongside you, uh, Richard Richter, who was one of the original interrogating officers, who's brought along some original documents for you to see. Those documents will be a source of important information for the German prosecutor, and no doubt of some embarrassment to the authorities in Britain. The secret report is not a secret anymore. Amen. I would like Bert Evans, one of our survivors, to lay a wreath on behalf of the branch. Bert Evans is now so hard up he couldn't pay his last gas bill. The man responsible for blowing his arm off and murdering his comrades, remember, has a war pension of £20,000 a year. They shall not go as we are left that are gold. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun, and in the morning, we will remember them. We will remember them.